You're listening to the really useful podcast, the tech podcast for technophobes. My name is Christian Corley. I'm an editor and writer for MakeUseOf.com. And with me is one of my Make Use Of colleagues. It's Megan Ellis. Hey, Megan. Hey. How are you doing? All right? Good, thanks. And yourself? Not bad. First coffee of the day. Mm. Roaring to go. Raring to go. <laughs> In this week's really useful podcast, we will be looking at a number of new features that have been added by some popular services. Google's new tool to help you pronounce words, translate place names on maps, Apple Music's replay function, Spotify now soundtracks your ride, and Twitter allows you to follow topics. And we'll also be taking another look at Disney Plus as they announce their launch dates for Europe. We'll be taking a look at my experiences getting my Samsung tablet repaired. An ongoing saga over (laughs) the recent series of the really useful (laughs) podcast. Uh, Megan and I will have some recommendations for you. And we've got some tips, ways to run Android apps in Windows. What you can do with Rentometer in order to lower your rent. How to scan old photos and some free printable board games to keep you entertained perhaps over the coming holiday season let's crack on with google they will now help you pronounce words they now help you pronounce words um they detail these new language skills in a post on the keyword the first new skill is an experimental pronunciation feature that lets you practice your language skills. And the second is the addition of visuals designed to give context to words and their meaning. So you basically Google how to pronounce a particular word, perhaps anemone. Uh, Google will show you the correct pronunciation and then give you the option to practice it. Uh, Now, Megan, you live in a part of the world where there are many languages. Is this something that would prove useful? I definitely think so, especially for people who who might be learning um, English as a second language or trying to visit some place with a new language. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it will definitely help with the pronunciation. And I find it what's very useful about it as well is that it's not necessarily using um, <clears throat> the RPA, which is the International Phonetic Alphabet, which is a bit difficult to to read if you haven't like studied linguistics or don't yeah. know what all the symbols stand for. Yeah. So I do think it could be um, quite useful. Uh, depends also on how many languages um, they're including including <laughs> right now, because um, I can't imagine some of the more obscure kind of languages non-mainstream languages um, would be covered. But I definitely think it's a step in the right direction, and especially for those those words that even English speakers get wrong, like epitome and an enemy and those types of things. Yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. It's a cool feature. I, I like mm. the look of it. Um, so I, we, we do give Google quite a lot of, lot of flack for um, decisions that they've made over the past few years. But I think this is a nice feature to add. And they've also given us the way to uh, translate place names in Google Maps, uh, which should make it easier for you to get around while you're abroad. Um, Again, uh, it's it's linked to the previous uh, topic. Um, All you need to do is search Google Maps for the place you want to visit, click on the entry, look for the speaker button next to the place name, and Google will tell you how to pronounce the name in the language of the country you're visiting. So again, this is a useful tool. I'm I'm often tickled by um, the the kind of this is largely a soccer football complaint. There's a kind of sporadic part time approach to the names of foreign cities. Okay, so. Mm. We call Bayern Munich Bayern Munich, but we should call them Bavarian Munich or Bayern München, which would be obviously the German way of pronouncing it. So, I, I, and that's just one example. So, um, you know, it's nothing to do with this. It's just a bugbear of mine. Um, so, yeah, Google Translate's. Um, is integrated into maps, which will definitely help you to get around. I wonder if they will mm. introduce a photo feature as well. So you can take a photo maybe of like a road sign or street sign, and then they'll mm. tell you where you are in English. 
Yeah, it definitely helps if you can play back on your phone if you're asking for directions or something, especially in mm. a language whose sounds you might not be familiar with. Um, yeah, I mean, even just yeah, somewhere like, yeah, a lot of our place names are in English, but a lot are in Afrikaans. There's Zulu, there's all kinds of different um, place names. Mm. And I imagine someone who's never seen it before, especially since everything that's written here is still written in the English alphabet. So yeah, applying yeah. your English pronunciation to it could be very confusing. And even in some way like the UK, where there might be like Welsh <laughs> names or Gaelic names of places, I know there's some places that I don't know how to pronounce because they're actually Gaelic or Welsh names and like they'll start with a double or triple L or something. So I think that'll definitely help out. Yeah, definitely. Um, is there a hierarchy in South Africa of what language appears first on a sign? Or does it um, just depend on where you are? Yeah, I think it depends where you are, but we usually, a lot of signs will have English, Afrikaans, then Zulu. Um, yeah, uh, but uh, a lot of our place names are the same across, um, Yeah. kind of like it'll have an official name. And if we do change the official name, we, we won't really provide the alternative names, but okay. um, there's definitely, it's not it's not as kind of efficient as you might find somewhere like Switzerland where they have, you know, all four languages um, on signs. But yeah, definitely, like if there's warnings or that type of thing, um, you'll see three languages at least on signs. Okay, interesting, interesting. Uh, Apple has launched a new Apple Music feature. Uh, Apple Music Replay compiles your favorite songs into playlists and this feature also provides you with statistics based on listening habits uh it's basically a way of collecting data and then giving it back to you i'm um, showing you what that data can do in terms of uh, reflecting your listening habits uh, as well as playlists for each year you've been subscribed to apple music you can also view other statistics based on your apple music usage um, so it's basically a feature that condenses listening habits down to statistics and lets you sort of play it. It's a bit like Spotify's um, features. Um, mm. Yeah. So yeah, it's. it's I do. Um, well, Apple being leaders in music for so long, but really from. Wow. The, what we used to call in the in the previous century, what we used to call the turn of the century. But seriously, <laughs> since you know, since two thousand, Apple have been there with music. It, it's weird to see kind of Spotify, and in some regards, uh, Google Music, sort of like getting a lead on Apple. Because uh, mm. you really thought they had all this tied up, but uh, it's good to see them playing at least playing catch up, rather yeah. than rather than the old Apple tactic of pretending there is no competition at all. <laughs> they're, they're the only organization doing <laughs> anything. Um, how accurate do you, do you expect the, the recommendation playlist to be? Oh, well, <laughs> that's, that's the thing about these statistics, isn't it? I mean, I can... You know, it's like take Apple, um, Amazon Music. Beg your pardon. If I put, if I say uh, Alexa, play Crash, this shit off. Yes, it's off. Right. If I were to say Alexa, play classic rock, um, it will play a classic rock station, and it will always start with Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. <laughs> now, that's not a massive problem in itself, but it always starts with Bohemian Rhapsody. I don't necessarily want to listen to Bohemian Rhapsody first. In fact, of all the Queen songs, while it is undeniably a grand fantastic song it's possibly not my favorite queen song so i don't necessarily want to hear that first i also probably although obviously it's a rock song most well at least half of it uh i might not although queen themselves i would i might not put bohemian rhapsody into the quote classic rock kind of subcategory anyway i would be more expectant of things like uh uh Cream, um, the Eric Clapton band, or or Deep Purple, or Led Zeppelin, or Thin Lizzy, or ELO. So like, there's a load of other bands I would put down as classic rock or songs from other bands before I would think of Bohemian Rhapsody in, in that category. Whereas a song like Now I'm Here or Tie Your Mother Down or you know 
all the Queen songs from the 70s, I would put in as classic rock. So, yeah, it's, it's you know, so the, the, these things work to an extent, but they're not perfect. Mm-hmm. So I think they've still got a long way to go. What do you think? Yeah, they. I've I've got a pretty strange taste in music in that it like it spans different genres and um, when it tries to recommend things to me, I'm just like no, I I happen to like this one single dance song and like yeah. don't recommend dance to me in anything else. <laughs> um, so it does. Um, I use Deezer, so it it struggles to get a grasp. <laughs> of my musical taste because like it, it the my most recent recommendation playlist had um mostly musical things and i guess it's maybe for me like listening to like lemurs or something like that and then now it's like suggesting other random musicals or like if i listen to something in the soundtrack of sweeney todd um, so it, str- it struggles to get a grasp there um but, I mean, something with Apple, with the track record, it has, um, if someone's been listening to things on iTunes for the last, you know, 20 years or so, I think it might have a better a better grasp of what that person enjoys. But yeah. um, even me, sometimes my favorite songs, if it, they play them too much, they're no longer my favorite song. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I think the algorithms don't, don't have that quite down yet. And I, I do still prefer to listen to my own playlists that i've made like i think it's just because we do we do have these things like you were saying what you consider classic rock it doesn't always necessarily fit the algorithm so it's me like with my my epic classic ballads and stuff like there's very specific things i'll count in the ballads and then like the algorithm will suggest something else and i'm like get out of here you're not a ballad (laughs) Well, you know, a few years ago, I used, um, before they um, blocked it in the UK, and I could still access it via VPN, I do from time to time, um, the Pandora service. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, I basically put in a Led Zeppelin song, and then it then suggested a whole library of records that I would say 70% of which I'd either never heard or even never heard of some of the artists, mm-hmm. um, which I think I like that kind of, suggestion of finding something that's similar by someone you haven't heard of yet is a, a good track there was a group uh, you might you may want to google these later there's a group for instance called spooky tooth who i'd never heard of <laughs> which you know they had a fantastic name for a start off that's not <laughs> as if that isn't enough but um yeah so i, I got some of their tracks and that was good um there's a load of others so um yeah i think it's as if it's I know maybe um, Apple Music and and Amazon and Spotify need to maybe work on what they're mm. linking up. I don't know, but um, I do I do get the feeling they tend to go for bigger acts rather mm. than more obscure ones in their kind of suggestions. But we'll move on to Spotify anyway. They will now soundtrack your ride. Um, this lets you create playlists for car journeys. Uh, this is particularly interesting to me because I've just created a playlist for a, a car journey. Um, so you go <laughs> to a URL soundtrackyourride.byspotify.com log into your Spotify account and then start um, then add the start and end points for your road trip using Google Maps um, sadly this is only a US feature at the moment then you you can also manually enter the length of your ride then there's a quiz that asks you who you're travelling with what's your, dri- what's your drive vibe <laughs> and what is your ultimate driving song and then it will then create a playlist for you based on upon that uh that's kind of a cool feature i've been sat mm. manually creating a uh, soundtrack uh for driving based on a lot of classic rock uh some of the tunes from the v rock station in grand theft auto vice city as well <laughs> some of that's in there oh there's a whole host of things in there. every everything from blues music to sort of like 80s hair metal to be honest <laughs> I wonder if it's it's um, region specific. Like if you're driving through Alabama, will you get some like banjos and that sort of thing? <laughs> uh, that would be cool. That would be actually no. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah, they should totally do that. Um, so yeah, that's a Spotify soundtrack. You're right feature. And yeah, so check that out if you're going anywhere. Uh, now Google, well, we've been talking about all these uh, services are adding new features. Google are adding one which I don't think I want to get involved with. This is called 
topics. And uh, as the name suggests, they're topics you can follow it in order to see tweets about those subjects. Right, and that's Twitter, not Google. Did I? I uh, said Google. Did I, <laughs> I, uh, Twitter is launching a new feature called Topics. Yeah. And now the, th- the thing with this is um, I might end up just getting cross with it. Mm. Um, you know, Google, I, I prefer with Twitter. And they said Google there. With, with Twitter, I just prefer to follow people. And then if they talk about stuff then I, that I don't want to know about, then I'll just use the, the filter. I think mm. if I'm following a particular topic, I'm going to find opinions on that topic that I don't agree with. I'm going to find people that clearly haven't got a clue. And that's just going to make me cross. And then I'm going to feel, right, I need to respond to this person. Then I'm going to half write a message and say, I don't need to respond to this person because <laughs> there's no way I can convince them how wrong they are in 280 characters. So why bother? Uh, if only everyone on Twitter had the same feelings about <laughs> this. But there you go. Uh, what do you think of this, Megan? Um, like I wonder how effective it will be because firstly, already, if you see certain topics, you're going to follow... Um, the hashtag anyway usually that's how you end up following topics Um, yeah like you said maybe if there's a topic you're interested in you don't necessarily want to hear everyone's opinions on it Um, and if like if I just think like there's so many divisive topics you don't like it's it might be a good way to get both sides but you don't where where there's so many trolls and like bad faith actors you're going to get a lot of tweets you don't necessarily want to see and then there's also how are they prioritizing what you're going to see under these topics and stuff because well, yeah. yeah we we already know that platforms prioritize specific people um based on things like engagement and that type of thing so i don't necessarily want to see people who might like monetize rage and therefore have a huge amount of followers and interaction and stuff, but basically just post things to, to get people angry. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm currently very happy with my gaming and, uh, cat pictures (laughs) vibe I've got going on, (laughs) on Twitter. And I mean, already, I always have to switch to the chronological timeline because I really hate the top tweets feed. So I don't, I don't really see myself following it as a like following the topics and stuff because they, yeah, it's you don't know who's necessarily getting boosted and there's a lot of bad faith actors out there who, yeah, will send you down a Twitter spiral. <laughs> and just yeah, totally, totally agree. And the other thing, the thing about this is in humanity. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> The thing about this, though, is um, it might, on the face of it, be a good feature, but Twitter isn't exactly on top of its other features, is it? So why are they spending time introducing new features? For instance, on the Twitter app and on the website as well, you have the option of latest tweets or the the other one, the most sort of popular tweets at the moment. Now, if you switch to one, you can guarantee that within, say, 10 to 14 days, it will reset to the other. Mm-hmm. Now, the very fact that that happens, I'm thinking, why are you wasting time bringing out new features? Fix the features that, you, that you've that you got, that people are getting annoyed with yeah. before you roll something new out. It just doesn't make sense to me at all. Mm-mm, definitely. We will move on from Twitter. Um, Disney Plus, uh, which is already available in the USA and Canada, will be, uh, it's also available in the Netherlands, curiously, but the rest of Europe <laughs> is not. Uh, however, a date has been given. Uh, now, first of all, as of the 19th, so the day this podcast goes out, uh, Australia and New Zealand will be added to the Disney Plus map of mouse ears across the world. And then in on March the 31st, Disney Plus In 2020, March 31st, Disney Plus will launch in the UK, Germany, France, Italy and Spain. Now, there was some question as to whether the UK would be included in that group, which I think is something to do with Disney contracts with um, Sky TV, Mm. which is um, has a larger presence in the UK than other parts of Europe. But that seems that seems to be uh, resolved. We now in the UK are getting. Disney Plus, along with Germany, France, Italy, and Spain, on March the 31st, 2020. So, you know, it's still four 
four or five months away, but it is on its way. Uh, mm. So everyone desperate to watch The Mandalorian mm. can, can wait a few months. They'll do just that, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, no, no mention <laughs> yet as to dates for South Africa, uh, although oh, they're yeah. expecting Asian South America probably in 2020 or early 2021. Yeah, we're we're not on the road map map anywhere in Africa. It's even the, up till 2022, we're not on the the road map currently. I don't know if that's got to do with licensing agreements. It probably does, but it's like mixed feelings because you're kind of glad that not every like we don't have the same selection of streaming services because everyone seems to be kind of now bundling up their their content mm. into a separate streaming service which is going to it adds up over time for for consumers but also um yeah you kind of miss out on being able to to stream some of these things because as you know like um Disney started kind of removing or canceling things that were on Netflix previously and now places regions that don't have Disney Plus yet might be sitting without Disney content on other streaming services, but then they can also not access Disney Plus yet. Um, but hopefully the service improves. I did hear there were quite a few issues with it on launch day, but I'm sure they're going to be sorted by the time it heads to the UK. Fingers crossed. Mm. Okay, let's uh, move on now. Everything that we've spoken about so far in the release of the podcast and everything we're about to discuss uh, has a corresponding link, mostly at makeyourself.com, and they can be found in the show notes. So uh, take a moment to um, refer to the show notes for anything that you want to pursue further. It is now. Now, is it is it that time or is it that time? Oh, it's Samsung update time. Okay. <sighs> My Samsung tablet still isn't repaired. I um last week that's right, last week someone had been a few days before and they'd sent the wrong main board and he tried to get it a, a new replacement main board out quickly, but that didn't happen, it got cancelled. Then last week I didn't hear anything from them until uh maybe midweek i think it probably was um no it wasn't no actually no it was thursday i rang them on thursday and basically had a nice conversation with a lovely lady and she basically uh helped me quite a bit and had a conversation with a colleague contacted samsung so we had a nice conversation and the lady informed me that samsung would call me later that day so yeah great Let's get this sorted. I accept Samsung didn't call me at all on Thursday. And I did, however, it was awfully good of them, receive a text message, which I'm, I'm going to read out to you now. And this, they write, this is an update on your Samsung SMT830 repair. It is still in process. We hope to complete the repair as soon as possible. We apologize for delay. Now, dodgy grammar aside, <laughs> uh, as far as I'm concerned, the repair isn't in process because the tablet is about five feet away from me. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I imagine I'll probably be calling uh, WeFix or Samsung later on today to um, give, give them further encouragement from me. So that's the uh, situation with the – I mean, I think it's been going on about six – maybe seven weeks now without wow. using the tablet um and you know it's a top of the range tablet as well so it's really really frustrating that i can't use it i've got notes stored on it and i've actually i've got st notes stored in my samsung account and for some reason i can't access my samsung account uh from the web so i don't know what that's all about either so yeah it's really really annoying me uh to to to, yeah it's annoying me let's 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 find something far more interesting and entertaining and positive to talk about it's recommendations time in which uh, your weekly hosts of the really useful podcast f share something that they found that was interesting or awesome or amazing or just really really educational on the internet 
Now, a lot might have been YouTube. Uh, this week is no difference. There's a guy called Colin Furs. He's a YouTuber, and he makes ridiculous stuff, basically, <laughs> like a jet-powered pram. Uh, he's <laughs> also, was. I know, he's also made a set of stairs that turn into a slide, a industrial strength toaster which ejects the toast across the room <laughs> a bed that ejects you out like Wallace and Gromit uh this guy he's British he's been on YouTube for a few years now he's he's even written a book about crazy inventions and stuff uh he's definitely worth finding on YouTube you th- there's no way you can get to the end of one of his videos without a smile on your face he made magnetic boots he also made um I'm pretty sure there were some Wolverine claws as well and some sort of flamethrower. So, uh, yeah, I mean, he's not necessarily safe, but he, you know, he's produced these things in a safe way. And he, do- he doesn't really give you a tutorial either, although there will be a kind of build video accompany, and then that will be followed up a few days later by kind of a demonstration of the thing that he's built video. So they're definitely worth checking out. He's a really cool, engaging YouTuber. So ch- check him out. Uh, and the link to that will be in the show notes. Megan, what have you got? Well, um, in my, my YouTube adventures lately, um, I've mainly been watching a lot of SciShow things, and they're, they're a series of channels. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but basically, if you're into, like, nerdy questions, knowing their answers, and understanding, like, a wide range of topics from a scientific standpoint, then it is, it's great. It's hosted by... Uh, partly by YouTuber Hank Green, but they've got a whole team of people and like various uh, channels. So there's the general SciShow channel, then SciShow Psych, and a variety of other channels. Which it's it's really nice, like little bites to understand various topics related to health, general science, that type of things. What if mm-hmm. questions? Recently, they published a whole. Um, <laughs> kind of marathon of all their cat related videos and dog related <laughs> videos um which was just awesome so i i find i really enjoy these kind of channels that are about like sharing knowledge and that type of thing and i find that they they publish a lot of content and also like relevant things even if the questions are a bit out there um it's still not these kind of like really really odd questions you never wonder about but um yeah, I've I've been enjoying their content a lot lately. Cool, excellent. Um, check the show notes for the links to those. Now we're going to move on with our weekly roundup of tips and tricks to help you make better use of the technology in your life. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, something Megan's put together. Three ways to run Android apps on Windows. Now, I'm, I'm going to quickly summarize what options you've got here. You've got Blue Stacks which is an app. You've got Android's official emulator and you also have AirDroid. But Megan, why would I need to run an Android app on Windows? It depends on a variety of reasons. And each of these tools are basically um, aimed at different kind of uses or reasons you'd have. So something like Bluestacks is just an app player and it's mainly aimed at games. So if you want to play mobile games on a PC screen, that's what app players like Bluestacks are mainly targeted towards. Um, you can play things like Brawl Stars or um, I'm not sure if, if like FPS games <laughs> will be included, but it, it's really useful. You'll have a bigger screen. You can hook up your controller to it as well. So if you're really into mobile games but prefer the format of PC, this is where something like Bluestacks would help. Whereas something like Android Studio is a full emulator and it's quite intricate, not too intricate in the setup, but it's definitely more advanced than something like Bluestacks, which is just install and run. Um, And that's more if you want to develop your own app, look at things like code, um, and you need to emulate a full Android environment. Whereas something like AirDroid is more about being able to remotely control and mirror your phone so Mm -hmm. sure you can play games on it if you prefer um there will be a slight bit of lag because it's not it is mirroring directly from your device rather than setting up a separate environment but um if it's things like you you want to check your messages or remotely control your phone in some way without having to get up like if it's charging in the other room then 
something like Airdroid is more useful for that. And I, there's there's like a huge host of like ways to now run Android <laughs> separately. Like you even can get um, dual booting as well if you don't necessarily want to connect to your phone, but actually want to run an Android OS on a PC. Mm. Um, there, there's more ways available than ever. But these are basically the three ways for different kinds of uses and focuses that you have that are also relatively easy to set up in comparison to virtual machines or something like that. Okay, excellent. Useful stuff, useful stuff. Uh, now, this is an interesting one for me because I don't really live in, I mean, obviously people rent near me, but most people, there are two options for renting. There's private renting, and then there is state renting, which is these mm. days is kind of overseen by a private company. But um, that, that's the situation in the UK, and then there's people who own their own homes. Um, obviously, in the USA uh, and in other parts of the world, renting is a lot more popular than buying. Mm. Um, do, do you rent, Megan? Uh, no, we, we okay. have a mortgage, but okay. most people I do know renting especially among my generation yeah yeah so um and finding rent rates in your area that you consider affordable and suitable for the property can take a lot of hard work now along comes a service a free to use web application called rent is it rentometer or rentometer i kind of like the fact that rentometer is quite a cool word it it, <laughs> it, 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 it feels a bit acme so we'll go with Rentometer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Should use Google to to show you the real pronunciation. Totally, absolutely. <laughs> uh, now there's a Rentometer Pro subscription as well, uh, but it's free to use to start with, and it gives you the option to uh, basically the finding out what the price you should be paying for the property that you want to rent is. Maybe you can use that to find a better option, or maybe you can. Good luck. Um, <laughs> persuade your landlord to lower the price um, <laughs> but uh, yeah it's a really useful web tool where you basically input the address where you want to live and the rent and the bedrooms and then it'll give, give the number of bedrooms and then it'll give you an idea of whether the rent's a good price whether it's too low whether it's too high i'm going to stick my neck out and suggest it's probably going to come up saying that your rent may be too high mm. but well, i mean it's a really really useful service i'm surprised yeah. no one's done this before really Maybe it, it's been difficult to kind of get the rates or to aggregate the rates Yeah. people are renting at. But I definitely think it's useful because I don't know how recently you might have searched for, for rentals and that type of thing. But um, especially in growing cities or places where housing is limited, some people really do like skyrocket their, their rent. They essentially want you to pay off their bank loan. Yeah. Um, so you'll find ludicrous um, kind of prices and like something next door will be half the price. So I definitely think it's useful, especially for people who want to look for something affordable, sustainable, that type of thing. Um, because some people really do take chances, especially since so few people are buying houses nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the last time I rented, uh, I was... A lot younger than I am now so <laughs> um, it was all done on paper there was no internet option mm. and and uh, I think I mean I have come across rentals when I've been looking for houses to buy um, you know window shopping new houses for a growing family uh, so you do come, come across rental options and uh, where, where I live is kind of post-industrial so you're not going to get huge renting prices around here really uh, but yeah, you know, it's um. My sister lives in London, so I'm well aware of the uh, the, the issues for people renting in in cities. So mm. yeah, I think a tool like this and other services such as Zumper, which is a website that allows you to compare rental cost by city, and Rent Jungle, a rent comparison search engine that's similar to Rentometer, uh, are also worth checking out. Let us proceed. You'll find the link to Ron, Ron, Ron Temeta, Ron Somato. You'll find the <laughs> link. You will find the link to Rentometer in the show notes. Um, now, if you are someone who likes to uh, collect old photos and feel that maybe it's a good idea to digitise them, 
keep a digital copy of them for whatever reason, maybe to add to a family tree database or simply as a backup, uh, you will probably know that uh, scanning and digitizing old photos is a little bit tricky. Uh, for instance, if you were to scan an old photo or any photo, um, it's very difficult to do so without getting some dust on the glass. So that's a bit <laughs> of a pain. Um, Make use of Andy Betts has uh, compiled an article on how to digitize photos, why you should, such as um, to overcome damage to physical photos. I've actually uh, scanned a photo some years ago of myself that had a tear in it and uh, using photo editing manipulation tools, I was very easily able to get rid of that tear and some folds in the photo um, and other blemishes. Uh, photo frames and albums and storage boxes take up space and of course family photos are meant for sharing so what better way to have them digital and then share them on facebook or instagram or whatever uh, now there are different ways of doing this you can use this standard scanner to scan old photos at home although it can take a while mm. to do that you can buy um scanners that's pretty good at scanning and digitizing photos so that's one option. You can use an app to digitize photos. Uh, this is a slightly better option. There's a few of these available at the moment. Um, Google's Photo Scan app I used just a few days ago and I found a crazy old photo of me with a kind of, uh, I don't want to call it a mullet because it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't a mullet because it was long at the front as well, uh, but it was an absolutely atrocious haircut. Mullet adjacent um, hairstyle. Mullet adjacent. <laughs> Mullet adjacent. That sounds like <laughs> sounds like a like an acting troupe or something. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah. And so the, the the photo scan app is really really cool for that, and it's free on iOS and Android. And you basically point your phone at the photo and move it when asked, and you basically move it in a square around the dimensions of the photo. And then it basically gets rid of things like reflections and lights from the photo not being straight or whatever and deals with some discoloring. And it, you, you end up with a good version of the photo rather than just snapping a photo, which a lot of people do, and that really annoys me. I get really cross when I see a photo of a photo. <laughs> I don't know why, I just do. <laughs> uh, you can also use photo digitizing services. Um, these are basically... Um, services where you send things away to be digitized and then they send it back to you with the digital version. Uh, services such as Scan Cafe, Dig My Pics, Scan My Photos, or you can choose a local service if possible. Megan, have you ever scanned any old photos? Not really. My mother's attempted to. Um... And it did not come out well. The, you know how scanners are. Like just a few years, it, once it's a few years old, like the technology has changed so much that the initial ones that my mother attempted to digitize were very grainy and washed mm -hmm. out. Um, but and then she started using her phone because <laughs> to take a photo of a photo, <laughs> your pet peeve. Mm -hmm. But um, actually worked out quite well it was doing better than the the older scanner um but yeah i i tend to still have some of my my physical photos in albums and that type of thing where they're mostly yeah. safe and i am part of the facebook generation so basically most photos from when i was 16 onwards are digital anyway yeah. Yeah, yeah. But um, I definitely think it's useful, especially if you have old photos of family that you want to keep um, or want to share on social media. Um, it's definitely useful and uh, it's a great way to keep it safe and also not worry about having to collect piles and piles of photo albums. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, my preferable way would probably be using an app um, with a good smartphone. Um but, yeah, I guess it depends what you have available, how good your scanner is, um, and that type of thing. Yeah. I um, just remember, it might be a tip that you want to follow, dear listener. Last time I used a scanner to scan photos, I basically filled the plate, the glass, on the scanner with photos, like a jigsaw. Mm. To save time, I scanned several at once. Then I used a image editing app to basically crop the scan down and save each individual photo as their own file. 
So that's an option that you might do to save a bit of time if you are going to use a photo scanner. I think the best option is probably the um, if you if you want to save time. I think the best option is the photo scanner. Mm. That that works for me. That works for me. Um, show notes will be interesting for that. You've got a lot of options for uh, if you're looking for a digital photo scanning printer. Uh, you've got some good options in that article, so give that a read. We're going to finish with something that I pulled together a few days ago, uh, which is. Um, free printable board games <laughs> so this is basically instead of you going out and buying a board game and paying the associated cost with that you instead pay for paper and ink and and dice and maybe poker chips and counters and then print it out yourself now there are i think nine i found nine awesome free printable board games there's a game called kill dr lucky there's a game called take back toe there's the Doctor Who Solitaire story game, which is a big one for Doctor Who fans. <laughs> uh, and this is kind of set in the kind of uh, David Tennant era of the 10th Doctor. So about, as, as we're recording now, about 10 years ago in Doctor Who, that's the kind of the, the era that that's set within. Uh, there's Cards Against Humanity. There's actually a free version of that. Uh, there is Timeline, Zombie in My Pocket, Pirates and Plunder, which is... Uh, kind of a version of Carcassonne basically Lego guess who which I've simply <laughs> got to got to try but you do need an original guess who board for that and make your own monopoly options with of which there are many now this is a, a I mean the term board game has been used pretty loosely across this there's tabletop games there's board games there's card games there's uh this kind of strategy counter games in there there's basically something for everyone in that list so i would urge you to give that a look whether you want to play on your own or if you've got friends coming down and you've got good you want to play a board game but you don't have anything new or suitable then check this list and you're, you're guaranteed to find something of interest and they all come with instructions they all come with printing guides uh output money printing just make sure you've got enough ink before you start otherwise it might make for a very <laughs> boring evening of coloring things in uh Megan, do you have a favourite board game? I'm trying to think. Um, I do enjoy Pandemic. Okay. Um, and like I, I, I enjoy Scrabble and um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what was that? I do enjoy Monopoly. I know, I know it breaks families up, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a very, I'm not, a, I'm a sore winner. I'm not a sore loser. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I don't play as many board games in our home because uh, I share it with a bit of a sore loser who doesn't like my gloating. <laughs> <laughs> so, this all so, sounds very familiar to me. Yes, everyone's got that in their family. They've got the sore <laughs> loser and the sore winner. And see, I'm a sore winner because I'm so not used to winning that when I do. <laughs> I'm going to make a big deal about it. Um, so we try to focus on co-op games. <laughs> but I really do like competitive games. Um, and yeah, just... I, I do enjoy those ones that don't overwhelm you with with too many rules. Because I find... Um, tried... Was it Treasure Island or something? Which was just so many layers and rules that it, it was quite difficult um, but yeah, even the simple card games, they're always fun to bring out, especially when you have friends over, you're having a barbecue or something. Um, yeah, and I definitely think that, yeah, the printable games makes it more accessible. Um, and then you could even up your printing game and 3D print pieces <laughs> if you have a 3D print available. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely think it's great, especially things like uh, Cards Against Humanity, which um often get imported from like the US or something so they their price just skyrockets um once it's imported and i definitely think it's it's a great way to keep the cost of tabletop gaming down while still being able to enjoy um the games and the fun yeah sure i um Mon- monopoly's one that gets played a lot here i used i mean back in the day there was a, a single player game from games workshop called chainsaw warrior <laughs> which has since been uh, it's basically a single player card deck game uh, but it has since been uh, revived on Steam and I think it's on Android as well uh, uh, nothing will beat the, uh, the, the the original game though I don't think 
But um, we, we have different versions of Monopoly in our house, but we don't have the original Monopoly. We have one called Monopoly, I think it's Monopoly Build It or something along those lines where you kind of, the, the, the game path is different every time because you have three different versions of the game board. Basically, you hook it together. It like clicks together and then you work your way around it. So we have that one. We've also got Cheats Monopoly, which my son absolutely adores because he cheats all the way through. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, you still end up with the whole problem of board flipping and tantrums and people getting cross with it. So it doesn't, if, if anything, it exacerbates those problems. <laughs> so if Cheats Monopoly is on your radar, if you're planning to basically inspire your family to move into different houses, buy it. <laughs> Otherwise, stay well clear. Uh, I think your, your 3D printing point you made is a good one, though. And I think, yeah, there's, I mean, there's got to be some case for grabbing a guess who board or frame and, you know, mm. 3D printing one of those, I would have thought. Yeah, and even you can 3D print. Uh, we've been doing that 3D print parts to help you sort your your actual board game pieces and inserts without having to buy the additional inserts and that type of thing. Um, mm. Yeah, it's, it's actually very useful the ways that you can combine traditional printing and 3D printing to kind of like up your board game tabletop experience. Totally, totally. Uh, well, you know, that wraps it up for this week's really useful podcast. We will be back next week for the final show of 2019. Uh, James Frew and myself will be taking a look at next week's forthcoming event, Black Friday. So don't miss that. And if you grab the podcast pretty much as soon as it drops, uh, you might find yourself being able to um, pick up a few useful offers that you weren't previously aware of. That's the aim for next week's show. Until then, it's goodbye from myself and goodbye, I think, from Megan Ellis as well. Cheers. Cheers.